yeah, as you already said, what I would like to uh, show you today is about what kind of chances mobile mapping specifically bring to our industry today, but also tomorrow. And when you look into tomorrow, you always want to have a look a little bit into the past because it actually gives you pretty good indications of um, the future. And as you know, in the 1990s, um, ter digital toll stations become widely adopted where you were not requiring always triangulation, you were able to measure points directly, which is of course a lot faster and simpler for many applications. And so in 20 years later, terrestrial laser scanning systems became really a standard tool in our industry and widely adopted, of course. Yet, still many people consider, uh, consider at least at these times that the toll station is just good enough for the majority of the jobs. And in theory, you can even convince yourself that a terrestrial laser scanning system is basically just a faster toll station, but with lower accuracy. So why would I even go for that, right? But in reality, a terrestrial laser scanning system is so much more, right? It's more comprehensive and simpler to use and fits most applications. So comprehensiveness also sounds sometimes a little bit like a nice to have, but what it really means is that it's um, floor flatness, for instance, pipe diameters, so many important applications and things that you can do with it. So why I'm actually telling this is because I would like to remind you about the skepticism that pretty much any new breakthrough technology is facing, especially beginning, but basically until everybody has invested into it. Now, terrestrial laser scanning system for sure have um, seen some strong innovations in the 2010s, but meanwhile, basically they are all the same, right? At least from my perspective. They have about the same accuracy, about the same size, and the biggest innovation that you would assume these days from a terrestrial laser scanning system is that it's gonna be a little bit cheaper, right? But um, they all have one thing um, in common, and that is its limitation to be only able to scan when you are static, when you're sitting at a place and waiting until this thing has done its job. And that means that um, the project accuracy and the project requires that those individual scans need to be merged through scan-to-scan -scan matching technologies. And that requires our thought through setup of these individual scan positions. And some of you will probably already be able to point out, it's like, yeah, Georg, should have placed them better. You can put them directly into the door frames and then you're even better in terms of registration. But it again just proves the point that experience in the systems are more important than to have the most precise scanner in the market. So now, as I said, last 15 years, static, right? So what do we have to do to be even more fast, even more comprehensive and to go to the next level? And that is obviously you need to be able to scan while you're moving through this environment. So it's actually a logical continuation of what has happened. But why wasn't this actually offered in the past, right? Why wasn't that already happening a lot many years ago? It's because terrestrial laser scanning systems are dominating um, drivers in this market and they have been perfectionizing the hardware, the lenses, the lasers and so on. But what you need for mobile scanners is to perfectionize software. You have to absolutely ace the way how you actually compute the trajectory that you're uh, moving through space and at the same time build the 3D geometry of this environment. And this is what's sometimes called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. It's only a part of the whole story, but it's definitely a very important one that is then written in software. So thus, mobile scanners much less rely on the most accurate and precise lenses and lasers, but much more on amazing software that is improving with every single software update. So while lenses are frozen, kind of set in stone if you want, with device that you're buying, software is getting better and better over time. So let's understand this a little bit more into detail, right? As I said, in the current stage or also in the past, the laser scanners are purpose-made hardware, very expensive hardware for a few hundred units being produced. And then of course they are set in stone. But today, laser scanners or LiDAR are used for so much more. They're used for autonomous cars, for robots, and they need a very comprehensive, very dense um, um, uh, um, yeah, sensing of the environment. Not just one laser pointer, multiple layers, sometimes as much as, as tens or twenties of those. And so this is what you see on the left side. Yeah? A lot more comprehensive laser scanners that are capturing the environment immediately and in a much smaller form factor as well. Um, on the contrary, however, they have a higher noise of around three centimeters. 
Now what Navis is doing and what others are just about to be um, really trying to adopt is to get from this data, from some, some like three centimeters accuracy, getting this into six millimeter of accuracy. And this is possible thanks to SLAM and AI data fusion. I just tried to summarize this. Come to our booth and I will explain you, I will bore you with all the details. But it's really a lot of stuff that you actually have to do to be able to get there. So see, this is the left image. This is what we get on the right image, these very fine details. These are extracted from exactly these sensors. This is what you call also software-defined um, laser scanning in contrast to just better hardware of lenses and lasers. So most, if not all vendors, if you go to some booths of, let's say, famous names here and ask them, so what's the future of laser scanning? If they're honest with you, they will answer, software is. It's not the hardware. And this is exactly where we are basically really acing this. So on this slide, it really becomes apparent that mobile systems allow you to do a lot more per project and per person than was ever possible and to grow your business. And as a matter of fact, pretty much all of our customers were able to increase their scan volume by a factor of two or even much higher. So something like 400,000 square meters per year per device is nothing special, right? This is just average. There are the special cases are if you are able to map two million square meter per person per device. And imagine what that actually means for your business. It's a huge game, a game changer. So now to bring this back into perspective, mobile scanners were available as early as the 2009s. So it's been around for quite some time, but it only achieved mass market uh, adoption when um, these first units have been available in 2020 that significantly came below the 10 millimeter mark. So there's right now something like six or eight millimeter on the market. So it's also worth noting that I'm not saying here there is a TLS versus total station versus mobile mapping. They really play nicely together, especially in complex environments where, for instance, a mobile scanner can pick up a control point surveyed by a GPS rover or a total station and then to bring all those point clouds back together to be then compared against, um, let's say, a 3D model or a 2D floor plan. So, so much about the theory, but let's see if that's actually all true. So what I brought with you here, and now this audience has to become a little bit more active, is two scans. One is actually, um, so what, there's two different scans. I'm not telling a lot more about this, but like which of these um, scans actually coming from a terrestrial laser scanning system and which one is coming from a mobile system, right? I hope it didn't make it too easy. There's obviously not these small circles on the ground that would be pretty obvious, but um, let's continue just for a moment and, and have a look at the video and then see if you can actually spot some differences over there. I think like very nice buildings indeed. One is actually in Munich, other one in Stockholm. So you can already take a quick poll. So who thinks the left video is coming from a mobile system? <laughs> one, two, three, very few people. <laughs> Go on, no one dares. Okay, who thinks that the right video is coming from a, a mobile system? A lot more hands. Well, you're both right, they're all coming both from the VLX. So <laughs> I hope uh, you've been able to see that there is actually not that much of a difference anymore, um, at least on a visual perspective. But of course, let's also have a look at the numbers. So what we have done to do this is um, we actually captured a part of our office with a terrestrial laser scanning system, 600 square meter that is. We took around two hours to do that. Of course, we could have done it faster, but we used also total station to really generate a ground truth so it's not that I'm saying that usually you take one and a half hours for 600 square meters, but this was the ground truth exercise. And then we did the very same um, with the VLX. And well, it took us six minutes. That's I think like 600 square meters in six minutes, that's a huge difference I would say to what you were able to do. And the accuracy, and you compare these two scans have been six millimeters. And I could say that's a coincidence. I'm happy about it at least. That's something very, very cool. I'd say it's probably a world record. And if you look at it now, how this actually looks like, um, and you can have a look at this video also offline um, when you um, basically want to show it to your colleagues. This is the scan that has been captured with the VLX in just six minutes. I think you can say that's fairly um, comprehensive. If you look at the staircase, for instance, um, and we're just walking through this environment. 
And then um, in a short while, I will show you two sections, two slices of these two point clouds. The first one from the terrestrial scan, the second one now from the VLX overlaid, and you see how nicely they are actu actually matching. Yes, there are some differences in, in the fine edges that is pretty clear because we used one of the most accurate laser scanners, terrestrial laser scanners in the market, but this is really minor. You, you cannot see this with, a, um, with an eye only. You really have to then zoom very much in. But again, you can do this yourself. Just um, watch the video. And here you also see how we have scanned this. There was no use of control points to make the accuracy better. It's just a pure scan. These two point clouds have been registered against each other through ICP, so that to make it absolutely fair. And um, then you basically looked into the accuracy, which is again six millimeters. So you see like very normal scanning. I will just skip this in the interest of time. So now the question obviously appears to all of us. So is it all about reducing the amount of work, reducing the, um, the time and cost? And the answer is obviously no, right? Much like with the internet, I think like in the early days, whatever, I don't know what a kilobyte of, of internet costed at that time. Of course, we are paying much less per kilobyte these days, but we're not, we are paying actually more to access the internet and the services that are on top of it. It's actually drastically more. So where you're actually able to reduce the cost, you're able to allow for more applications. And now let's look at this trend that is not driven by us, right? It's already happening every single day. Static laser scanning itself reduced the cost by just the, the device being a little bit faster, a little bit um, cheaper itself, and it's incrementally reducing the cost as well. So on the lower ch part of this chart, you see how the costs are coming down gradually. And then on the upper part, you see the number of use cases and projects that are really exponentially rising. And now the question is like, what do we do with this trend? We cannot stop it. It's just happening. No, quite a, no question what, whatever we are doing, right? It's just continuing. And the question is how to leverage this. So where in the past, we have seen that there are some dedicated singular high value projects. Meanwhile, we see that it's much more used now relative capture for um, high value processes like factory construction planning, any kind of planning um, uh, yeah, jobs. And mobile scanning certainly had a big uh, part in that already to drive um, this and to make this possible. And we see on the, on the current um, uh, part that everyday uses for a broad variety, including construction management, even where on a monthly basis scans or if sometimes even weekly, what I have seen um, are happening, and including facility management, are really just increasing the number of jobs drastically. And this is, of course, not the end of the whole story, right? We've seen first um, so providers, this, this Intergeo, but even the, the last few that have started to provide autonomous scanning solutions. Right? And they really allow you to provide daily scanning with any um, manual human interaction. And of course, you know it's not true. Right? Of course, there's someone next to the doggy that tries to basically using this joystick steer it around. But it's still first prototypes that show us where we are going, where the vision is actually. So while mobile mapping has started in 2009, here we see first signs of autonomous scanning that will drive this trend even further, providing an almost real time representation of our, um, of our buildings, our infrastructure. So now let's look a little bit into the applications in a little bit more detail um, to close it. We see, of course, many of you have been working on as-is documentations already. And terrestrial laser scanning, in contrast to total stations, have been a big play in that. Because we were able to look into the real details, um, provide architects and engineers and planners with point clouds that they can work themselves in meanwhile software that is capable of using point clouds directly um, draw to the floor plans very easily. So there's a lot actually happening and smaller and smaller projects are possible to do this profitable thanks to mobile mapping. And actually there's also a chance to be even more comprehensive now since there's so many panoramic images, they can really immerse into the scene and discuss this with stakeholders to come to conclusions without even meeting them. In construction verification, I think there's also a big movement these days. You see that more and more um, laser scanning is being used to compare the current state of the construction site with the plan, with what it's supposed to be, to find errors, mistakes very early on in the process, right after they have happened, where you can actually save them real quick, but a month later, it's gonna be 10 times the cost. You know? So this is really extremely valuable. 
and still it wasn't possible to use thoracic laser scanning because it was just taking too long on site, it would hinder the people to actually work and it would be too expensive. And mobile mapping actually addresses this and opens this space for all of us. And lastly, factory planning. And this is where um, we are also quite active actually, where people these days in a lot of different industries really have to face the reality of sustainability, improve time to market, and be so much quicker in iterating on their products and thereby also into their factories. This ultimately means that the experts need to come together, decide on reliable as is information about this factory, and then be able to come to the best possible solutions. And to do that, again, they need to have a, a trusted resource about uh, the conditions. And this is exactly how they can immerse through um, the scans and also software that brings them immersively directly into this factory without traveling. And certainly, it's also a big improvement in terms of sustainability that people don't have to meet and to travel all the time. So you can see there is so much more that we can do. You can say unleash with reality capture these days. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. We'll also be able to meet me at the booth and to discuss about the x hacks of SLAM and also uh, the solutions that are uh, driven by them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Georg, for this very inspiring talk. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. I, I see uh, ma many more application domains where this could be used, for example, yeah. in, uh, in crisis management, if there are catastrophes, uh, buildings yeah. are destroyed and you need to have an ad hoc status of the situation. Do you also think of applications like this? Yeah, absolutely. So these things don't even come to my mind myself because I'm not an expert in all these fields, but I'm so happy to see that, for instance, um, in Fukushima, the VLX has been used, right? There's actually videos online that you can check out yourself and you see that people are using the VLX to as fast as possible capture the current conditions and to make them available to people outside that can take decisions on those facts. And um, I guess I can also share that it was used in the, I think it was the G7 summit, right? Where uh, the secret um, service was using then also um, reality capture provided by the system and then also our software to really find out <laughs> how they can make everything super secure. So things that we haven't even thought about, certainly so far for us niche applications, well, I'm more than happy to learn more about that. So you could also mount your, your scanner on a robot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can and we did, of course. I think there's not just rumors, there's meanwhile already, let's say, some uh, incidents that we have done this for many years now already with largest customers of ours. Um, it's absolutely possible to do this, but we're not trying to fool people into some POC or something. We're trying to really solve their problems. And if someone is just starting to, to scan a building, they don't need an automated solution. They need this if they need it frequently, if they need to do it like almost on a weekly basis, at least on a, on a monthly basis, right? Other than that, I don't see that much use today, but again, um, quite a few of our biggest customers are indeed doing this already. So there mm -hmm. are robots, um, they are not four-legged uh, mm -hmm. yet, but um, they are already doing this. So this is nothing new for them. Um, they might just see themselves confirmed by what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other question concerning the, the system architecture. Yeah. Where is the calculation of the, of the model being done? In the edge, in the device, or is it done offline in some cloud environment? Right, exactly. So we believe that the device should be as slim and, and simple as possible, and all our powerful algorithms are actually needing quite some compute power, which we don't want to put in there. So what you have on the device is a live version of all of these algorithms, so you continuously see what's going on, and if you have scanned everything, and you can check this out at the booth, but um, the, the magic, if you want, um, that is really getting this to the finest millimeter level, that is happening actually in the cloud, right? Where you just take out our, um, our SSD drive from the VLX, put it into any PC, upload it, and there you go. You can just leave it um, at rest and come back. You actually receive an, even an email once it's done and just look at the data and make it accessible to all your stakeholders. Okay, and for such a scan of six minutes, uh, how long does it take to have uh, then so the result? The good thing about uh, the cloud is that you can massively parallelize this, right? Right now, I guess it will be something like half an hour or something, okay. but that's really not um, the bottleneck in a sense. So it's more like something that um, we will, of course, improve, but usually um, the best thing is probably to upload this once you drive home, you already have it, right? So, so far we didn't see this as the biggest uh, bottleneck so far, but yeah. if it is, happy to improve it. The cloud so will help again, us. the infrastructure is the bottleneck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, if you think so. Um, for our customers, okay. usually uh, it's okay to wait half an hour, but yeah. 
Okay, uh, no further questions from your side, from the audience here. Uh, and also no question uh, in the chat. So thanks again, Georg, Thank for this uh, very interesting talk.